Linda scratched one of his long gray mustaches with a finger the size of a fat sausage. The first gardener commander of all the Ogier and the High Lady Tuon's bodyguard was almost as tall as a man in the saddle and wide with it. His red and green lacquered armor contained enough steel to make armor for three or four humans. His face was as dour as Misenge's, yet his booming voice was calm. Ogier were always calm, except in battle. Then they were as cold as deep winter in Jerenim. After we rescue the High Lady, we can kill as many of them as need killing, Misenge. And that's Hartha, Chapter 34, A Knife of Dreams. Hello and welcome back. I am here with my good friend Tracy in the flesh. In the flesh? I'm here with my good friend Amber. And this is The Road to Tarvalin today, talking about the Ogier Gardeners. And have to say, there's surprisingly very little from the books that we get. Tiny. Tiny. It's very small, but I think the meat of this episode is going to be a lot of conversation about how, I guess, we imagine things to be because Mm -hmm. there's so little. Mm -hmm. So we can kind of go by what we know from the books, from the few chapters where the gardeners are mentioned, Mm -hmm. and maybe some from the Big White book. There's a little bit here and there, but... I guess the first thing to talk about is what are the Ogier Gardeners and what they do and where they're from and that whole spiel. Yeah. These aren't Ogier, like I think we get introduced to Ogier at the very beginning of the series. These are Ogier elite fighters, soldiers, defenders. Like, they only protect the highest of the highest of the Shan Chen hierarchy. They're just so different. They're much more militant than what we see our gear and the Westlands being. And it just feels so different from, like, book reading loyal and, like, happy thinking about singing to trees and stuff. So different. So we go, we have to go all the way to Shan Chen land, territory. That's right. And the Death Watch Guard is comprised of Dako Vale, which are slaves mm-hmm. in Shan Chen, mm-hmm. but because of the hierarchy in Shan Chen, we can go into that a little bit later, but for the most part, the Death Watch Guard is this elite force comprised of humans mm-hmm. who are Dako Vale slaves and Ogier Gardener who are free. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting that one species slave and the other not, so it almost has this kind of a feel of them being on like a higher level being shown more respect almost yeah but because shan chen is kind of backwards and a little messed up in shan chen culture sometimes to be a slave puts you at a higher position as a freed person Mm -hmm. so like if you are dako vale maybe somewhere higher up Mm -hmm. you would actually be at a higher class level than a wealthy merchant, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Like a certain level of respect would need to be shown to you, even though you would be considered property. Yeah. Yeah. And even though, like, maybe this rich merchant is free to do whatever he wants, he or she would have to, like, show, I want to say respect again, but I feel like I'm repeating myself, for the Death Watch Guard, so the men and the Ogier. They are even held at like a half rank or something above the regular soldiers. Yes. But when we're talking about the Death Watch Guard, it's important to remember that, yeah, like they can be militarized, Mm -hmm. but they're mostly in charge of the royal family Mm -hmm. and the immediate family of the Empress. Yeah. So. They behave as bodyguards. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're going to, let's say, retrieve a missing person, maybe someone goes missing. These are the people who you want, like, on the job, on the case. Mm -hmm. And they're the most loyal fighters, the most fearsome fighters. And they are completely willing and ready to die Mm -hmm. for this cause. And that's what they sign up for Mm -hmm. when they become who they become. Yeah. In fact, the Daco Vale, the, the humans... If the person they are protecting dies while they are on bodyguard duty, like this 
this is their person that they're protecting, they are required to take their own lives. The Ogier do not have to do that. That's another one of those like distinctions between the two. And I'm very curious about how that decision was made. Like what was the what was the conversation where it was like humans are enslaved, but the Ogier are not subject to the same sort of enslavement? Like, is it maybe a, a respect for their long lives? Is it, I don't know. I would assume just because of their long lives, like when you, when you think about a human perfecting any type of craft, mm-hmm. like we see this with our Ogier and the Westlands, like they're so knowledgeable mm-hmm. because they live these really long lives and they have all this time to study and read yeah. and do these things that they love. But when we're looking at the Ogier Gardeners and Shan Chen, these extremely long lives, I think, would lend them to really have all the time in the world to hone their craft of just becoming the most fearsome warriors yeah. as possible. So when you're living 300 years old, mm-hmm. you've got a lot of knowledge and battlefield mm-hmm. training that mm-hmm. I guess would put you at a much higher level than a human. Yeah. Yeah. This is just my opinion, but if an Ogier gardener in Shanchen like decides this is what they want to do, when we were talking about them, the Daco Vale, the humans in the Death Watch Guard, mm-hmm. killing themselves if they fail at their job, I have a feeling that the Ogier counterparts would make the choice mm. to do it as well. Like these are people that take themselves very seriously. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think there's great shame for them failing to keep the Empress safe. Yeah, yeah. And that's a, I think that's a big factor in Shanshan society overall, is it's militant and it's also shame-based in a lot of ways. Like, there are always these statements like, oh, I couldn't do that. It would lower my eyes forever. Like, there are certain things that, as a member of the society, you are expected to to do and if you don't do the shame you would receive from everyone else around you would just be crushing yeah and so i can definitely see that like the ogier would potentially make that choice to like take their own lives at the end of something like that but they aren't required to right because they're not property so daco vale is also hereditary not hereditary it's passed down you could be born into it exactly And so you don't really get a choice. Someone may see you as a Daco Vale and be like, you know what, you look like you're going to be a really good soldier. We're going to put you in the Death Watch Guard. And then you get trained for that. How do you think maybe the Ogier are chosen for this? If they aren't property, do they volunteer? Do they show up and they're like, hey, I'm a total badass Ogier and I want to be part of the gardeners and the death watch guard or do you think like maybe they go around like they do for like the soldam and the domine and find the ogier that they think would be good for the death watch guard i would assume that it's something they choose themselves yeah we know that there are a lot of ogier in the westlands we don't know exactly how many are in shanchen but Mm -hmm. we do know that their steadings cover much more of Shan Chen so that the longing doesn't set in. Mm-hmm. So does that mean that since there's more steadings, that there are potentially more Ogier? Mm. Like it's a higher population of Ogier mm-hmm. per size of Shan Chen versus the Westlands? Mm-hmm. And if that's the case, if there are more, we know of about... 20 Mm -hmm. ogier gardeners Mm -hmm. in the book series Mm -hmm. so if that's you know 20 out of like whatever thousands yeah that's only a very small amount yeah so i don't think any of them would actually like decide to do this if it wasn't something that they were really passionate about Mm -hmm. and maybe there are only so many spots available right because again if like Oh, gear live a really long time. You're only going to have like, and it doesn't seem like there are a lot more than twenty. Like I've only read the highest number I've read for the gardeners is twenty four. And so if there are only twenty four, 
and each ogier lives to be like however many hundred. Three hundred. Yeah, yeah. How often does that? Maybe that's another reason for them not killing themselves, though, is they've worked together for so long that they're like a really cohesive unit. So. Yeah, I I know that we have Hartha, who is pretty much the only gardener that we really get mm-hmm. much information about at all. Yeah, and he's the first gardener. He's the. He's Second the in command of yeah. the Death Watch Guard. And first in command of the Ogier. Yeah. Yeah. So he has a, a big role in that respect, but we really just don't get, other than like this little statement of him being like, we'll kill who needs killing later, we don't really get a whole lot on like we what don't kind know the- of an Ogier he actually is. We don't know their thoughts. We don't know their motivations. Mm -mm. We don't know how they feel about their duty. Mm -mm. Besides, we're going to do our job and anyone who needs to die (laughs) in our path is going to die. We're the guys. We're going to take those guys out. I also think that it's a little disappointing that we don't ever really get to see them fight. Because Ogier is supposed to be, like, really fierce. Like, we hear about that even from, like, gentle, loyal that like right there's there's a fear around the ogier partially one because nobody really believes in them anymore and thinks that they're like fairy tales and so a lot of times poor loyal is identified as a trollic and it sends everybody in a panic but then the other thing is like the history of the ogier in the series like comes all the way back to like the age of legends when they were like a police force and i hadn't really remembered that until I was going back through notes and stuff that like not only were they part of like the singing to make things happen in the age of legends like growing things and whatnot they were part of enforcing whatever laws needed enforcing which also points to the fact that the age of legends was not a utopia because you wouldn't need a police force if you lived in a utopia just a little side note little side note can't resist it sorry (laughs) yeah I think one of the most for me, interesting parts about the Ogier history in the Westlands is that they have been a part of major battles mm-hmm. pretty much as far back as recorded history goes yeah. in the series. Mm-hmm. So they're doing their thing in the Age of Legends. Luz Theron Telamon was chosen to lead the Ogier warriors during the War of Sha- the Shadow. Oh. And... At this point, like, their peace had been taken. Mm -hmm. So we know the Ogier really strive for this harmonious life, Mm -hmm. wherever Mm -hmm. they might be. And when the War of the Shadow shows up, this is something that they had to get behind because Mm -hmm. this was infringing on their peaceful life. So this is when they decide, hey, like, we're joining, Mm -hmm. we're fighting. Mm -hmm. And I really love that relationship, knowing about it, because Luz Theron Telemond, such an important figure in the history, but to know that he had a really close relationship with the Ogier Mm -hmm. is also really fascinating because of the way that the entire story goes to the end Mm -hmm. and we get to kind of like think like, okay, are the Ogier going to become very important Mm -hmm. to the series from the beginning to the end? Mm -hmm. Maybe yes. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. And I think there's also like during the Trolloc Wars, the Ogier were involved in battle at that time too. Like it was another one of those situations where Everyone needed to be involved in order to defend and protect and preserve life as everyone knew it. And they became such fearsome components of each battle that, like, people became afraid of the Ogier and what they were capable of. And it's such a flip for me. Like, I think groves, I think peaceful, I think reading books, I think things that grow. I don't think of Ogiers as being violent, but the fact that they are capable of such violence and they kind of like curb it, maybe maybe, maybe that's why they like the groves so much. They're just afraid of what they can do, of what they can become. And maybe in Chan Chen, because the entire society has maintained a militant aspect throughout all of it, there isn't that same torn feeling between 
needing to be apart from the world. Like they can be a part of their society and be militant and not have people be afraid of them. Yeah, and honored in a way. Yeah, that's a good point too. Like people see them as someone, something attached to the crystal throne. And for Shan Chen, there's just nothing, maybe, nothing higher. Maybe that's a part of it too, because there is this need for harmony mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. for the Ogier. So if your leader, like your supreme leader of yep. the nation is missing, is in danger, and we know within Shan Chen society, the immediate family of empress Mm -hmm. like this is scary because so often like family members will assassinate other family members Mm -hmm. so like your peace can only go as far as whether or not the leader of your society can do their job and if they're missing if they're in danger Mm -hmm. this throws the power structure off Mm -hmm. upheaval Mm -hmm. and then there's that threat of disruptive imbalance Mm -hmm. in society so maybe this is another reason why someone one of the ogier and shanchen would be like hey i feel passionate about this sign me up Mm -hmm. like i need this peaceful state and this is something that i can do to keep the peace so it is a little bit almost like this law enforcement type deal that we're seeing from the age of legends Mm -hmm. just on a different continent in a different location. <laughs> yeah, and gone about in a very different way. Like, for the Ogier and the Westlands, their choice was to just, like, retreat. You know? They come out every once in a while, they help with some building, and then they go back to the groves and whatever it was they are doing. And in Shanchen, instead, they're like, if peace needs to be maintained through violent measures, then that is the direction that we will choose. It's almost like a sacrifice, like when you when you put your life on the line to protect other people, that is probably how they see it, is protect and preserve, instead of hide away and not be a part of it. Huh. Hmm. Huh. I like that. Yeah. I always think about, like, the duality of the Ogier, mm-hmm. but it kind of just depends on harmony right Mm -hmm. like there is a duality about them but as soon as the linchpin moment happens then you get that flip get the fuck out just get away (laughs) yeah yeah oh gear are terrifying and they're huge they're really big and these oh gear aren't just like it's not just that they're big it's not just that they're strong they are armored and they have huge axes yeah, for the for the Death Watch guard. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like not not Westland's O gear. Like, yeah. So like you think about a regular man sitting in a saddle, mm-hmm. like they might come up to the same height as an O gear standing. Yeah, yeah. And so in the big white book, I think it's in the big white book. It's said that the Ogier stand at about ten feet tall mm-hmm. or three meters, with the women being a little bit shorter Mm -hmm. which is massive yeah massive huge that's like two of me that's like me on my shoulders yeah and it's not just like tall either like they're hulking wide so like and i think it's in the quote the amount of armor the death watch guard needs Mm -hmm. to cover their body is enough armor that could cover three humans yeah yeah, one of the things that I think is kind of cool, too, is that members of the Ogier Gardeners can be loaned out to other people. So, like, if you had done something to really ingratiate yourself to the Emperor of Shan Chen, mm-hmm. they could send you an Ogier Gardener mm-hmm. for whatever task they think you might need help with. Yeah. And this is, like, a great sign of honor. Like... Probably one of the highest that I can think of, except for being, like, raised to the blood. Yeah, yeah. So, can you imagine that statement? Like, you're you're walking into some negotiation, and it's not necessarily expected that things are going to go your way, so that the empress or the emperor is like, here, have a gardener. Take one of the gardeners with you, and you walk in with a gardener. Like, 
how differently would that make the other people look at you knowing that yeah. the Crystal Throne is directly involved in what you're doing and showing it through the support of your bodyguard? Yeah, and we know like when we the the amount of gardeners that we know about are kind of because of how many are sent over to the Westlands, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. So you said that number was twenty four. Mm-hmm. Does that mean that they just came over in the first and second waves? Like, because obviously, like, all of Shanchen doesn't just sh- plop up right. on the shores, yeah. right? <laughs> so maybe there are many more that are left behind. Mm-hmm. But I could see it as, like, in this scenario where we're sending over the first and second wave of soldiers, mm-hmm. how many of your Ogier Gardener are you going to give up for this cause? Yeah. And that, too, would be, like, a great honor to all of the military force that is showing up because mm-hmm. you've got gardeners there with you. Mm-hmm. So they're probably sending over the most important people if you're if you're coming with an entourage mm-hmm. of gardeners. Oh, uh, this is a silly little side thing, but, like, they wear red and green armor. And the green is so dark that to most people it looks black. And it really seems to irritate anyone who's in the Death Watch Guard or a gardener that everyone sees it as black and dark green. They're like, ugh. Black and red, you mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's black and red. And there's... there's apparently quite the distinction between the two. Yeah, and too, they are very serious about keeping it like so polished and so pretty looking mm-hmm. and so shine. Yeah. That, like, you can tell they take a great care in what they do and how they are perceived, Mm -hmm. which goes along with, you know, the honor of doing your duty. Yeah. And we are, did we talk about the first Ogier Guard being created with when Luther Pendrag died? No, go for it. Okay. So, one of the things that I was able to kind of piece out is that uh, the first Ogier Guard was created when Luther Pendrag died. And so this is after he's been sent from the Westlands to go conquer whatever lands might be out there. Things have happened, and apparently whatever he did while he was there was enough to inspire the Ogier to come and say, we will defend and be a part of guarding this hierarchy and how it develops. So they've been a part of Shanshan as it's growing since the very beginning. Which, I mean, seriously, I would love those histories, like the Ogier histories of the Shanshan to, like, you know how it is when you talk to Ogier in, like, the main series and, like, every once in a while someone's like, for us it was this many generations ago and for the Ogier it's, like, so many fewer. Like, to get that Ogier perspective of how that all broke down. That would be interesting. Because I don't think that they took... They didn't take any Ogier with them, right? I don't think so. Yeah, so these would have all been Ogier that were, like, already there. So something must have been going on. Something must have happened that convinced the Ogier that the right place to be, the right person to take care of, would be the person who was at the top. And that that was the best way to keep stability and peace. Which is weird considering how much of their stuff is focused on warfare, but there's that. Yeah, but the thing is, is they're not, they're not really battle commanders. Mm -hmm. They're more like soldiers. Mm -hmm. So like, they're not really in charge of deciding anything. They pretty much go where they're told Mm -hmm. and do what's expected of them. Mm -hmm. But I can't see them doing that with out believing Mm -hmm. that what it what's expected of them is very important yeah uh the other thing that i think is probably really difficult is they're expected not to attach feelings for the people they are protecting and how many different people will you have been the bodyguard for by the time you as an ogier come to the end of your life and that's just it almost makes me think of, like, humans with our pets, right? right? Like, how long can you live and how many pets, like, do you see come and go in your life and your friends yeah. and family's life? Like, it has to be hard for the gardeners to watch, like, this young child growing up and be 
in charge of making sure this person stays safe. Mm -hmm. And, like, we're talking about potentially three, four generations Mm -hmm. worth of people. Exactly. So it's... It would be hard not to have any attachment Mm -hmm. to them. It's a long, it's a long life. (laughs) It really, it really, really is. I don't know if it would make it easier or harder with the way that the noble families at the top, like, go after each other. You never know if the child of the ruling family is actually going to survive even past their first day of being born. You know, so like if you are in line for the crystal throne, it's like your life is under threat from minute one. And so they have to be on guard all the time because there is, I mean, without a doubt, there's always going to be somebody who wants to take out someone in line for the throne. Like you can just guarantee that that's going to, that that attempt is going to happen. So you never get a chance to like, maybe that's another reason they don't, they Maybe they don't need to rest as much. Like, maybe they can be on guard, like, pretty much all the time and not have, like, the same... I don't know. I don't know enough about Ogier physiology to know if they can, like... If their stamina is, yeah. like, is yeah, like it that is. Much, is it? It is because they can... I mean, they can run alongside a horse That's for, true. for how long? Yeah, yeah. Like, I a mean, lot of them don't need a horse yeah. because they're, like, happily just trotting yeah. along beside the horses so yeah thinking about loyal and i love running brand do you love running yeah (laughs) okay yeah that's good to know because like they are also considered the embodiment of the empress wherever they are so if you see like a death watch guard if you see a gardener you can pretty much guarantee that like what they say what they do is going to be a direct reflection of the crystal throne so yeah yeah okay so let's go ahead and jump into like full series spoilers Mm -hmm. because i know our death watch guard chapters happen a little bit later on in the books and we can't really talk about (laughs) it just yet so this is gonna be a lot a lot later in the books yeah this will be jumping into that the only thing that i want to say right now is just when I was reading about the Death Watch Guard and the Gardeners and, you know, Daco Vale and not Daco Vale, slaves or not slaves, it really got me thinking about kind of like the whole grift that the Shan Chen nation has people believing. Mm. So it's pretty much like their biggest cultural weapon. And it's kind of like getting slaves to look forward to upward mobility. Mm -hmm. Like if you work this hard and you do your job and you do it good, Mm -hmm. you might have this path to freedom Mm -hmm. or you might be working towards a place that gives you a position higher up than the slave beneath you. Mm -hmm. In Shan Chen, like the grift is getting their population to find honor in slavery Mm -hmm. and that's pretty much what a majority of where their power comes from is Mm -hmm. getting these people to really believe like if i if i just do it and i do my part and Mm -hmm. i'm i'm a good little slave Mm -hmm. like maybe one day things will be good for me Mm -hmm. and i i can maybe be ahead of someone else yeah so their society being what it is, sometimes a slave has a higher position as a freed person. Mm-hmm. So like the Ogier, the Death Watch Guard, yeah, they're free, but they're also in a very high position of power. Mm-hmm. So I'm sure there are some that like fully believe like this is a way to keep peace. This mm-hmm. is a way for harmony to exist. Mm-hmm. But... I'm not saying that there isn't a little bit of, like, the Sean Chen brainwashing going on here. Oh, yeah. It is kind of amazing how the whole the Empress may she live forever thing and how the people of the Westlands see this as being sincere across the board. And even, like, in this section where I think it's this chapter, A Cup of Cough, there's an observation of the Soldam and the Domine and like some of the Domine are so upset because Tuan is missing. And even though this Domine had been formerly Aes Sedai, she has now been 
beaten and brainwashed to the point where Tuan's survival is everything to her. And if that can be done with one person in a relatively short amount of time, what has happened over centuries mm-hmm. to make your people feel a specific way, including Ogier, like that's just that's some intense treatment. Like it's yeah. it's across it's across all spectrums of society. I don't I think we get like one quasi rebellious Sean Chen in Aginan. Yeah. I think she's the closest we get to like one of the Sean Chen being like is this really the right thing? Yeah, but the thing is, is she's not, like, doing a 180, and she's no. like, oh, like, clearly I've been seeing things Mm-mm. totally wrong. From her, she's always second-guessing herself, mm-hmm. and she's always thinking about, what if I come in contact with someone and they recognize me? What if they see me as mm-hmm. what I am? And mm-hmm. Yeah, she's still loyal. Like, even though, like, she goes through a lot of stuff and, like, not to get, like, on a tangent but just to kind of show like how deep this is for the people that live it like she's questioning but I think there comes a moment where like she's around two on again and she's still like on the ground fully prostrated like she has doubts and questions and we get to see that but she's still there's fear yeah yeah and like the structure of everything is so ingrained and I mean I can only imagine that it's the same way with the Ogier do we know if there are any female gardeners? I was just kind of curious because I don't think we really get anything to say that any of the gardeners or the Death Watch Guard are women. But, but they don't. Also they know... don't. Oh, sorry. No, it's okay. I was just gonna say we also know that like women are part of the Ever Victorious Army. So are there female Ogier gardeners? Let's just say that there are. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> Let's just say that there are. I mean, it also goes along with, like, the other things in Shan Chen. Like, you don't inherit the throne because you're a male. You don't inherit the throne because you're female. It's whoever can survive that's the oldest that makes it to the crystal throne. And even then, you should probably always be watching your back. So, yeah. It's a very different kind of society from the one that we see in the Westlands. And it's impacted every species there, really. So I know that we both went back and reread the chapters mm-hmm. from pretty much everywhere that Hartha mm-hmm. shows up. Yeah. And that was delightful. We've got like a lot of stuff going on. Mm-hmm. Tuan is missing, Mm -hmm. so there is one contingency of Death Watch Guard out scouting, searching, Mm -hmm. looking for Tuan. To find her and protect her. To find her and protect her. And then there is another faction of Shan Chen military who are out to get her, to find her, to kill her. Yeah. And we have Dear Matram Cawthon on the (laughs) other... We have Matt on the other side of things who is legitimately trying to keep her safe and he doesn't know who he can trust. Yeah. So comically, like these chapters are ridiculous and I love them. Mm -hmm. I'm not a big fan of the Tuan character. Mm -hmm. Like as a person, to read her, it's fine. But these chapters, just so much a glee. Mm-hmm. I mean, we've got we've got Hartha, mm-hmm. who is traveling with Kadir. How do you pronounce him? I always say Kadir. Okay, but Kadir, we'll go with Kadir. Farouk Kadir. And we've got this really humorous moment where Matt and the Band of the Red Hand lets Kadir find them, mm-hmm. and they're kind of like trotting along, and. The the Shanshan hear a bird call, and then mm-hmm. a few paces further, they hear another bird call. And it turns out, like, Matt's got the band of the red hand, like, all lined up, all scouted up, like, ready to go. And Kadir walks in, and for some reason, you know, he's firmly resolute with the fact that Tom Marilyn is leading the... <laughs> Tom Marilyn is leading the band of the Red Hand, and 
he marches into camp and he wants to talk to the man who calls himself Tom <laughs> Marilyn. And Tom is like, yeah, I am Tom Marilyn and I guess we can talk. What do you want? And then this is this moment where we have the meeting between Kadir and Matt Cawthon and Tuan finally announces that Matram Cawthon he is my husband. Mm-hmm. He is my husband. He is my husband. She says the words. They are married. Mm-hmm. Matt is flabbergasted. <laughs> Poor guy. Poor guy. But I think the really fun part is how this ends. And then the next chapter is pretty much, you know, Matt says, hey, these other Sean Chen that are coming do you think you can get around them? Mm -hmm. And they're like, I'm confident I can. He's like, no, but like, Tuan is everything to me. I need to make sure she survives. Mm -hmm. And if it is not like 100% yes, Mm -hmm. I can get through and get her to safety, then I'm taking the band and I'm fighting Li Shan Chen and then we will get her out of here. Mm -hmm. And so we have like this really like fun, epic showdown between the death watch guard mm-hmm. with some of the gardeners i think there's two or three in that group yeah i don't remember and the shan chen that are actually trying to kill tuan mm-hmm. and the band of the red hand and we've got dragons going and we have oh, ice and i just waiting to you oh, know fireball i don't feel in danger yet <laughs> yeah these are really really fun i liked his ploy you know, with like the the half built wall, and then that that was what I was kind of disappointed about, though, because in that chapter, this would have been the perfect chapter to have the Ogier point of view. Yes. yes, or even like see them in action more. Like we get we get Matt observing the battle as it's happening. We know the gardeners and the Death Watch guard kind of like swoop in from behind and like do shit, and then when everyone's on the ground. I think Hearth is like, I'm going to go see if I can find whoever's like in charge of this and whatnot. And he does. And he brings back the guy's head. The traitor. Yeah. But I mean, that was, that was it. I didn't get to see, experience, feel what those gardeners are like in battle. And I really, like if they are that fearsome, I want to see it. I want to be a part of it. I want to know what's going on. If I use my imagination, like I know what it looks like in a memory of light Mm -hmm. when the ogier take charge and they're singing and slaughtering and right you know they're they're basically like ripping trees out of the ground and using them as weapons Mm -hmm. and that's gnarly for one (laughs) but when you picture that and move it over to the ogier gardeners right what are they actually capable of i mean The axes that they carry are as big as a man. Yeah. Like, they are holding... Like, they are com- they are giant, cuddly, furry, murder demons. <laughs> <laughs> That's their slogan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a good way of putting it. So, Amazon Prime? Oh, God, please. Please don't short us. And, I mean, that's another thing that I'm... I'm The little teaser clip that we got, I yes. know I keep coming back to it, and it gives me hope, but that little section where we have Loyal, like, hulking out and, like, getting really angry. Like, if this is our first introduction to that duality of what the Ogier can do and be, I want them to keep pushing that. And in the first teaser that we got in July, mm-hmm. there is a Shan Chen soldier mm-hmm. who is dragging two bodies mm-hmm. behind him. I think one might even be Perrin. I don't know. It's been so long. Mm-hmm. But I I think that we might have already seen our first yeah. gardener. Yeah. If you go back and watch that little sizzle reel I think that, I don't know, I, I, I don't see a normal-sized man mm-hmm. being able to drag two human bodies with that great of ease. ease. Yeah. So, like, I'm really hoping that season two will focus in on having actual gardeners. It amps up the WTF moment of, like, 
you're watching these people fighting and you're like, okay, like we've got new baddies, throw Mm -hmm. them into the mix. And then you realize like, oh shit, they aren't human. Well, I'm wondering if they, if they do that, if they are doing that, is this going to be at the sacrifice of other potential creatures that would have come from Shantan before? Because I don't think we get the gardeners in that first like when the Corrine happens I think we just have yeah, but we don't we don't really get to see like all of all of the everything that's descended on like the very far end of the Westland yeah yeah that's true like we hear about it we don't yeah. really get to see that much of the destruction yeah but I think it would be smart to do because I mean oh yeah they're they're already covered in armor anyways mm-hmm. so like you don't need to do a whole bunch of prosthetic makeup or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like, you just need to have, like, a very huge mm-hmm. body yeah. inside this armor. And if you have one of them take their helmet off, you're like, oh, shit. Mm-hmm. Like, they're Ogier on the other side. Mm-hmm. We've got Loyal. We know what he's all about. Mm-hmm. But to have a reveal like that would be really exciting. And mm-hmm. I think it would be a really big world building. Moment. Oh, yeah. That would be so, that would be so cool. I I would love it. I would love it. I would be okay with sacrificing some sort of creature to have extra Ogier that are battly badasses. Like, that would make me really happy. Yeah, I mean, there's obviously, like, things that I don't love. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, everyone's a critic, right? Right. Everyone has something that they're not, like, in love with a hundred percent yeah but i think if i saw death watch guard and i saw ogier Mm -hmm. i wouldn't care Mm -hmm. like (laughs) i wouldn't care what's going on i would just be instantly like hooray yeah i am appeased i am good yeah and i mean considering how little we're given about them in the book series they would be one of like the few creatures storylines that you could play around with and explore so much more without longtime readers like you and I being sad about it because I would love to see more of them in the book if I can't get more of them in the books I want to see more of them in the tv series for sure so I really I really hope fingers crossed yeah season two is more than my friend on Twitter said, you know, like, fantasy is here. We've seen enough dragons. Right. Give us a Grom. Right. Give us a couple Grom. Yeah. The time of the Grom is here. It is. Give us the Death Watch Guard. Give us the Gardeners. Gardeners. I want things that we don't see in fantasy shows. Yeah. I agree completely. Yeah. So before we wrap it up. Yes. This is for the listeners out there. I don't know if you're watching on YouTube or listening on Anchor, but if the Book of Translation, mm, I love this, is open, <laughs> and we get like a we get like a snap back to the Ogier home world, mm-hmm. I would love to know what people's thoughts are because all the Ogier are transported, mm-hmm. not just in the Westlands. Mm-hmm. So like you would seemingly have the Shan Shan Ogier and the Westlands Ogier immediately back to where they came from. Mm-hmm. So what what do you think that interaction would be like? Would it be harmonious? Mm-hmm. Do you think that they would find a way to coexist or would it would it be enough to destroy the That is such a good question. That is such a good question. Will the need for harmony overcome? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so addendum. I realized that there were two things, two topics and theories that I wanted to cover that we totally forgot about. So first thing is the Ogier assimilation theory. And that's mostly revolving around the fact that, as mentioned earlier, the Ogier settings cover much more of Shanchen than they do in the Westlands. So when we think about our Shanchen gardeners and how their culture is much different than what we see in the Westlands, I would attribute that to them living in closer contact with Shanchen society. Mm-hmm. And they're able to kind of become more Shanchen in nature just mm-hmm. by living in cr- close proximity to people 
which the Ogier and the Westlands don't. They're kind of shut off from normal happenings mm-hmm. of the world, I would say. Their restrictions on how they can be involved are much different as well because they do have just those handful of steadings in the Westlands and they are not, for the most part, really close to humans and they can only be away from them for so long. And, I mean, because of the wars and everything that happened, the Ogier kind of also take a voluntary step back too. And so with the the Ogier and Shanshan, they just didn't have to do that. All those steadings just made it so they could be anywhere they wanted to be. Yeah. In the Westlands, after the breaking of the world, the Ogier really struggled because of this. And it almost changed their culture Mm -hmm. in a way where we see them shutting themselves off Mm -hmm. because they don't want to relive the longing again. And I think that brings us to the second theory Mm -hmm. which is kind of a weird one but after thinking about all the things that we talked about on this recording I had the question of what if the Ogier culture in Shanchen is actually more original to what the Ogier's culture was like before the longing Mm -hmm. so what if the Ogier and Shanchen are more like what the Ogier normally are like Mm -hmm. and we had this flip in the Westlands because of the longing. Mm -hmm. And they just like develop an entirely different set of characteristics. And that's why it's so shocking to us when we read the books that like these gentle kind of gear are not the same as what comes over from Shantan, if that makes sense. Yeah, but they but they do have that potential because mm-hmm. in the oh, last yeah. battle, like we see what the Ogier are capable of. Mm-hmm. And they they don't necessarily like being a part of the fighting, mm-hmm. but when they make that decision, yeah. They are just ruthless. Yeah. I was just thinking about how like the abhorrence for violence develops in the Ogier in the Westlands. And maybe that has a lot to do with the battles that they were involved in. I'm definitely thinking about like the Trolloc Wars. I think the Trolloc Wars in particular, were, were, that was the last time they were really involved in some sort of battle with humans and stuff that I'm aware of before the last battle. So maybe they just got like bloodlust. Yeah, like to the point where they're like, this is the worst thing that we can possibly go through. And we just don't ever want to do this again. And so maybe the the other, the Shanchen Ogier, did the Trolloc Wars affect Shanchen? Or is that just in the Westland? So there's rumors that Shanchen wasn't really affected by the breaking, which some people call BS on. It's not like there aren't flying shadow spawn i mean like even if you're cut off geographically Mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that some of the shadow spawn can't make it to shan chen but we really don't know enough about the shan chen history Mm -hmm. i mean there was this whole i guess side series that robert jordan planned to do on shan chen but you know we never got there Mm. because he died and i just wonder you know like like the Towers of Midnight are a big thing in Shan Chan prophecy. And mm-hmm. I think that goes back to the woman, the Aes Sedai. I mean, this is more like before the White Tower Aes Sedai, but she was a female channeler. She was the one that made the item mm-hmm. for Luther Pendrag. And she was imprisoned in the Towers of Midnight. And like, I guess like that's where you could say like this structure came into the history Mm -hmm. and i was almost wondering like who made these 13 towers Mm -hmm. were they were they ogier ogier built as well yeah like that's a good question we don't know what characteristics of the non gardener ogier Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. shan are like we Mm -hmm. don't know what they did and Mm -hmm. how they live but if I think about it, we see if there's a peaceful set of Ogier and Shanchen that kind of happily do their thing, and then there's another set of Ogier that are the gardeners, that is so similar to the Age of Legends, mm-hmm. where we did have some of Ogier, like, policing. Mm-hmm. So, like, it's who's to say if there really is that big of a difference 
between the Ogier Society and the Westlands or in Shan Chen because we just don't know enough about Shan Chen Mm -hmm. in general. Yeah. I think that's such an interesting point to bring up, too, that they might be more like the original Ogier. Yeah. And the ones that we have in the Westlands are completely completely changed different because of the breaking of the world and the longing. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, that's such a huge part of their life, their Mm -hmm. story in the Westland. So who's to say? Let us know what you think. Do you have your own Ogier theories? Do you say yay or nay to either of these (laughs) theories? Let us know in the comments. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening.